Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Physiology Secrets Podcast. Uh, we thought we'd use today as a good opportunity to answer a few questions that have come up in our mastermind group uh, over the last couple of days. So we'll get started with the first question that's come from Pete, but then also Simon jumped in as well in the comment section and so he found he was struggling with a similar thing. And it was to do with racing on consecutive days. So what they were describing is when they go out, they're, they're both cyclists, when they go out and they race on a Saturday um, and then at a reasonably high intensity, then trying to back it up on a Sunday uh, with a similar style of race um, in terms of similar length, but then also similar high intensity o- overall throughout the race. They find it difficult to maintain that power output or produce a similar performance or a high quality performance in that second day. So what they've been trying to do, and Pete in particular described a bit about his recovery strategy, um, typically recovers by taking in, taking in carbs and protein mostly through uh, drink form. So supplementing what he's getting in immediately post uh, post his event, but then also doing a bit of active recovery on the bike, so light 25 minutes of spinning at a reasonably low intensity. Um, and what the guys were asking is, is the struggle of backing up from the first race, first of all, a, a physiological side effect of, of just working hard on that first day? Um, is it inevitable? Is it going to happen? Second, Secondly, can we prevent some of this fatigue carrying over into the second race? And if we can, what, what, are, what are some strategies we can do to minimise the impact of of our first race is fatigue. Yeah, I mean, I mean as, as a simple answer, you, yeah, you, you're going to be fatigued a bit. So it is a physiological side effect backing up a hard race after another hard race. Um, sounds like he's done the right things in terms of doing what he can to recover. Yep. So um, getting you know, carbohydrates in, 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo within 15 minutes, ideally, definitely within an hour. He said he did that, so yep. that's good. Bit of protein as well. Um, so he would have going back to, in theory, would have got his glycogen stores back to full within that sort of 24-hour period. Did you say what time he raced on the Saturday? Um, I don't th- think so. I don't think so. That's right. So no. let's just assume it was somewhat the same time, so close enough to 24 hours. So he would have had pretty good glycogen stores. Uh, the protein's going to help with the, the muscle uh, resynthesis, the, the replenish... I can never say that word. Resynthesis, <laughs> resynthesis. I can't say. Um, so any muscle breakdown, that's going to at least speed up the process by getting the protein in quite quickly. He did an active recovery, so he's going to be flushing out the lactic acid, so the, the hydrogen ions, the fatiguing bike right there, so that's good. So he probably would have been pretty close to resting lactate the next day, I would have thought as well. Uh, what just, else did he do? Just touching, just touching on time, I've just got it here, so i just got back up. Yep. Um, he said race on Saturday was at 2 p.m., and his race Sunday was at 9.30. Yeah, okay. So, so, so short, shorter time period than that 24 hours is going to be going to be tricky regardless. Yeah, so you can probably, you know, yeah, you wouldn't get 100% glock, in fact, maybe 70%, but... Um, if you're still struggling to hit certain heart rates, etc., how far into the second bit? Was it? The so, race? Uh, first race, he spent 54 minutes above 80% of um, 80% of max heart rate. I think he's working off, um, yep. and then 34 minutes above 90%. So it's his usual hard effort. He says at about 181 peak, um, and then in his second race, uh, found it impossible to get above 85% of his max heart rate. Was 70 minutes above 80%, and then 84 minutes above 70%. So his peak was 166 instead of that 180. Yeah, so he never even so, got it up there. Yeah, he could, just yeah. couldn't get anywhere near his performance from the previous day. Yeah, so nutritionally done pretty well, as, as well as you can, that close. Um, he's done his active recovery. He, did he do ice baths? He said he did every, He did everything, but he didn't do ice baths. Okay, so ice bath would be would be probably beneficial, definitely beneficial for runners because the high impact, low, yeah. lower impact to cycling, you know, depends on how much muscle damage has been done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there is a fair bit of research to say that, that ice baths are quite quite effective in in uh, reducing that muscle inflama- inflammation and therefore the, the DOMS, the soreness after it as well. So uh, an ice bath might be a really good technique to use in the future. Um, the ice baths, the, the, the research behind that is saying that if you need to be recovered f- quickly, you, you want to use an ice bath. That if you if you don't actually need a race for you know, three, four, five days again, you're better off not having an ice bath because you get better mitochondrial adaptations as well yeah. as muscle hypertrophy, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, some pretty new new research there, but yeah, because you need to be recovered, ice bath would have been a good option. Um, but all in all, done, done a pretty good job, I'd say, in recovering. So it, it really comes down to, look, you know, there are going to be... Um, there's going to be some fatigue when you when you are racing in the space of, what, 16 hours, you're, yeah. that's that, and you, you're racing again. Um, you know, local muscular endurance is something that you could look at maybe trying to boost. So I'm not sure what Pete's training program was like, but trying to do lots of, of racing at least at that distance and above at that intensity and then having that short that short um, turnaround time in between training sessions will just get will build up your muscular endurance. So at least that way um, you, you should be at a muscular level be able to, to continue to contract 
uh, maximally throughout. Uh, caffeine might be something else you can look at. I know during, it's not like it's a super long event, but yeah. caffeine can definitely help with the, uh, the, the central nervous system, sending, sending the signals to the muscles to actually get them to contract. Caffeine's pretty good at that. So uh, that, that is maybe another one percenter you could look at doing is, is consuming caffeine in your gels or, or whatnot um, towards the end of the Saturday and also into the start of the Sunday event. But yeah, look, I, I think at the end of the day, you are going to get fatigued to a point. It's just about trying to, to prepare your body in the weeks leading up to that event by doing specific training and getting this similar uh, similar demands on the body so that you've got the muscular endurance there whilst then trying to still sort out that nutrition, um, getting the ice bath in because that'll be beneficial uh, and maybe looking at some stimulants such as caffeine just to give that extra one or two percent benefit is sort of all you can do. So it sounds like he's done a, a pretty good job and, and, and this, the human body does fatigue regardless. So. Mm -hmm. Bit of R and R, and he'll be right to go. But do, just... do you reckon dehydration plays a bit of a role? Not knowing too much in terms of what yep. what Pete or, or someone were doing rehydration wise, but both the both sort of events are, by the sounds of it sounds sort of road racing in terms of like eighty or fifty k's on a Saturday, eighty two k's on a Sunday. Couple of hours out there, I'm assuming each of those. Do you reckon that plays a pretty critical role in that sixteen hour window that we've got, or close enough to sixteen hours? Yeah, I mean certainly we know that what two percent dehydration or loss in body weight. 2% loss in body weight will, yeah. will cause like a 10%... Yeah, 11%. It's, is that core advantage? I don't know, is, is it body weight or is it hydration? I think it's 2% body weight, which would be about 1.6 kilos, something like that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Awesome. so, so 2% body, awesome weight body weight is, is like a 10% drop in, drop in performance. performance. So definitely hydration is, is mm. super important. Um, I'm going to probably take an educated guess to say that that might not have been the problem there. Because even though he couldn't get his heart rate up the next day, mm. normally when you're dehydrated, heart rate yeah, yeah, well, you lose your blood plasma, so your heart rate will actually go yeah. up as a side effect. But it also would increase your rate of perceived exertion, so you get that central fatigue too. Like if you're, if you're whether consciously or unconsciously, your, your brain is not motivated. You're not motivated, bro. You, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not going to to send as strong an electrical signals to the muscles, therefore they're not going to contract and then you're not going to need that much energy so your heart rate can't go up. So there could be some central uh, fatigue in there as well. But I'd say, yeah, definitely dehydration is, is super important. Um, but uh, if he's doing all the other stuff right, yeah, he's probably his stats, is getting yeah, his, probably. his hydration up there as well. Yeah, cool. Any, anything else to add in terms of trying to minimise the impact? Any other strategies maybe apart from ice bars that we could think about using? Like, is compression worth it? Are those recovery boot type things worth it? Hot, cold? Yep, set ice bars, but are any of those methods as good or better? Maybe not. Yeah, you could. You could do so. Um, he's done an active recovery, which is essentially what a, what compression boots would do. So they'll compress up, starting from the bottom up to the top. So that's basically doing a, a massage to get the blood back to the heart, so you can get oxygen in and get rid of lactic acid. Um, same with, as a massage, same thing. Trying to get the blood back to the heart. You could go to the beach. Um, salt water is buoyant, so that's going to put again push the blood back up to the heart there. Um, these are all doing the same thing, it's mm. just a different method to doing it. Hot, cold, in, in, in theory, is exactly the same thing. So you make, hot makes your, 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 I can't talk today, your, your veins dilate, and then when you go to the cold, it constricts, and bit by bit, that it essentially works as a, as a muscle pump and, and works as a, a massage as well. So um, they would all be quite effective, in, in at least in metabolising lactic acid, which yeah. is only one aspect. Um, and then the ice bath is more the... Not so much for the lactic acid, but more for the, the inflammation, inflammation, which causes the delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, I'm trying to think what other facts are there. Nutrition is done well. Hydration, I assume, is done pretty well. Um, I guess psychologically, I know massages are good for that because you feel yeah. good. Same with compression boots. So mm. it, it's done. It sounds like it's done most of the right things. It, mm. it really probably comes down to to just training more in that. In that specific environment, yeah. like that, that go and do a hard good. session on a Wednesday and then back it up Thursday morning and try to do yeah. a si similar type of session and, and practice that repeated type effort if you like day on day off, um, or like a day on uh, hard training session and a, a complete rest day hard training session isn't going to be as specific as to, to the type of racing he's doing back to back as going out and doing a hard session on a Tuesday and then a Wednesday following it up Wednesday morning. During his practicing practicing that style has a big effect. Yeah, I think so. I mean, even just for the, for the local muscular endurance benefit, so you, your muscles get used to doing that. Like, um, you know, you go try run a marathon after not doing any training. We're going to talk about it in a yeah. sec, hasn't it? Yeah. But you're going to get that muscle fatigue. Um, 
if you if you are doing 25 hours a week of Ironman training, you probably can back up. Yeah, you know, who can do it? You couldn't go do 30 hours of training right now. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, often, it's it's just yeah. you, your body adapts to what it what it gets used to. So yeah. if you can um, if you can replicate the demands as much as possible, you're going to adapt to it. So uh, and I'm not saying he hasn't. I don't know, but uh, mm. that that's that's coming into one percent. But at the end of the day, you are going to fatigue regardless. Yeah. It is only you know less than 24 hours yeah. between high intensity efforts. So. Mm. Yeah, cool. So hopefully that answers the question for, for both Pete and Simon, but an interesting discussion because we know a lot of guys will, particularly in the cycling and even running, a lot of guys will try and back up day after day. you got like to a Bright, to a Gibson, things like that, where you are racing multiple days in a row. So it, it may, may be a time trial in a road race or a road race in a crit, um, two crits back to back, but it, it's useful in terms of trying to nail some of this recovery process so you can perform at your best across the board as best we can, but keeping in mind that you are going to fatigue at some point. Um, second question that we will talk about today came from came from Duncan. He was asking. He's been back through through some of our previous episodes of the podcast. So if you haven't checked out some of those, go back and have a look. There's some pretty pretty valuable content. Some of the early episodes from the early days are sort of five ten minute bursts of information. So if you if you don't have too much time, it's it's really quick and quick and short. But he was having a look and he couldn't find too much on this, and so he he left the question for us to answer. But he wanted to know. Obviously, we talk a lot about training zones and and matching maybe like zone two sessions with zone four sessions or when when do we bring in zone threes and different blocks of training but he's asking is there any is there any logical science to mixing up some of those zones throughout the week so we we've already spoken in a previous episode about not mixing up zones in a single session can be a difficult thing to to work around so we wouldn't want to try and do vo2 max intervals in zone four at the same time as trying to do some some threshold intervals in that same session but he's saying is there any any use saying do it doing on a Tuesday some VO2 max intervals on the running and then cycling wise he's a triathlete doing some threshold intervals on the bike on Thursday and mixing up a zone four session early in the week and then a zone three session later and maybe some zone two around that. Is there any science or logic to it or should we just stick to zone two, zone four in a base, zone two, zone three in a, in yeah. a build and yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean my, my philosophy has always been to have a specific focus. Uh, the compounding effect of doing of a focus on one thing first and building that up is going to be better than, than, than spreading yourself thin and generally getting adaptations across the board. Um, so I'll start off with, with, with what, what I think and then what some of the, because it is actually pretty new science, like not, not a heap has been, mm. as far as I know, not a heap has been done on, on mixing up versus not. Um, but as I said, zone, we know zone two and zone four are to, to build the mitochondrial, get density, get, get more of them, more capillary cell and so forth, so we build the VO2 max. So the compounding effect of just doing that week in, week out for whatever, eight to 12 weeks is really good. And then you do, you know, just your zone three and or not just your zone three because you can get a lot of stress yeah. that way. Do a little bit of zone two just because you can't just do zone three all the time. Um, and then a bit of zone five to build your, your body's ability to buffer and tolerate lactic acid. So that's the, that's the philosophy we work by. Um, doing some research, I remember reading something, just to trigger my memory then, maybe, I would have been 18 months ago maybe, um, Simon Hearn actually sent it to me. It was, it was a case study on a cyclist who he basically did that. He just did um, like zone two, zone four stuff, and then in another trial mixed everything together. And I'll see if I can find the article. I've got it somewhere, but it was it was significantly better by splitting them. I think the compounding effect of focusing on one thing yeah. before the other. I don't want to give numbers, so I'd be I'd be guessing, but something like eight percent rings a bell about being better by actually splitting them up. Yeah. But that being said, look, uh, we're, we're talking. I'm not going to say we're talking one percenters, but unless you're at peak fitness, you're still going to improve either way. Mm. If you want to, it's the upside of doing everything in one week would be variety. It's probably more enjoyable sometimes. Yeah, you know, we know how, how boring it can be just mm. to do long, slow, and then high intensity intervals, which can be quite mentally draining as well. Um, so you get to create a lot of variety, which is which is good, particularly at the beginner level uh, and inter intermediate level. As you get more advanced. Uh, and get towards your peak, then you probably need to think about, all right, how can you really maximise the effect of this? And that's where you probably would be quite structured in, yep. in your training and making sure you are overloading correctly and getting enough load in and recovering enough. But, but, but getting very scientific about it is mm. sort of where I'm getting at. Um, but I, I guess from a science perspective, it, it is a lot of it is anecdotal um, because from what I... And it's probably... Probably is more accurate. I'm not certainly not a walking uh, mm. research article, yeah. but yeah. but um, the, the, what, what I've read, it, it's it's it is a little bit better to do it all as a concentrated focus, but a lot of people still do that, and, and you will see benefit that way. So I would say, you know, 
figure out what your goals are and, and you've got to be motivated motivated to train and, and mm. adherence to doing a bit of everything and not really anything is still going to be better. If you do that you know, 95% of the time, it's going to be better than skipping out half your session because you can't be bothered doing yeah. you know, your long ride or, or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, do some further research. I'll, we'll do, we'll do, yeah. some, do some ourselves because uh, there probably is more out there. But um, I'll see if I can find that article and post mm. it in the, in the comments. Yeah, because I know in terms of like skill acquisition space and, and lear- learning a skill, so if we're talking about like re- learning run technique, a lot of the research says that being being specifically focused in one aspect for a period of time is really good in terms of developing that aspect, having that that clear focus. And um, I was listening to last night we had um, at Footy we had Damien Farrow present. He's now a skill acquisition and innovation leader at AFL in terms of umpires now. He specialises in, in teaching and learning skills. He was talking about that specialist focus is something you see in a lot of elite athletes when they look when they when they block practice out whatever that may be their training, their conditioning, their whatever it is, there's a specific focus for a period of time to improve that aspect of their their event, their skill, their sport. And then they once they get close to mastering it, then they move on to the next one that they're slightly, slightly weaker at. And I sort of drew a few comparisons to what we talk about here is long-term look at a, an event six months away. We always talk about get the base in first because it takes the longest to develop. Specifically focusing on that is a good way to be like, all right, I know exactly... I'm very clear on what my goal is for this part of training. I know what every session is supposed to achieve. So maybe does that pre-frame the psychology of it to, all right, I'm going to get into that session and know that I need to nail it now because later on I may not have a chance to be able to adapt and generate that adaptation because I'm running out of time. So there might be something in that as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get some, we'll have a look into it a little bit more. I'd be interested in reading that article as well mm. um, to look at specificity and, and locking things down. Does that help to psychologically and physiologically generate a better adaptation than mixing things up. So good sort of area to, to work into. And I guess this is probably a good lead in to talk about mixing up training sessions into what you're going to take on in the next couple of weeks. We've got four weeks, is it? Um, to a Gold Coast Marathon? Yeah. Five weeks? Uh, probably probably Pro- four probably on Probably four Sunday. now. <laughs> probably four now. So do you want to just take us through, and this is the last thing we'll finish on today, uh, in the in this episode, but do you want to just take us through what you're trying to achieve in the next sort of four weeks and what you're going to do to try and get there? I guess. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone was looking at Instagram last Thursday night, uh, I did a little sneak peek behind the scenes, saying that yeah, I presented the Gold Coast Marathon. So I just happened to be up in Port Douglas for a holiday the week prior. I was going to fly back on the Saturday, and then I've got, obviously got a few guys racing on the Gold Coast on the Sunday. So I thought, oh yeah, why not have a crack? Um, the idea was that we would do some testing, some sweat testing, some VO2 max testing, trying to really science science as much as we can out yeah, of it. What, because, what can we get in five weeks? Yeah, because I'm yeah. not training. <laughs> yeah. I was going to train. Uh, literally, the, 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 the day I, I announced that on Instagram, the next day I got the flu. Happy days. Still a bit sick now. I'm probably sweating in the camera. Yeah. I'm a bit. So <laughs> um, let's be honest, I won't be back training properly till next week. So that gives us three, three weeks, weeks of training. <laughs> Plus a holiday I'll be out. I'm not going to train up there. Maybe a yeah. bit of acclimatization. Yeah. So look, we're going to do it off pretty much not a lot of training. So I'm just going to try to... Um, use the, the general base fitness I've got uh, and, and be a little bit scientific around it. So my ideal goal is to do sub 3.30. I'll put that out publicly. I'll try to do a sub 3.30 marathon. Never done one before. What pace would that be it's to get a 3.30? 4.40. Uh, sorry, 4.58. 4.58. Yeah, yeah, so it's 5 so minute case. 5 minute case to get a 3.30. Um, so what we'll do is is next week we'll jump on the treaty. I'll get my lactate values at certain speeds. Um, early signs actually looked all right when I tried the other day. We'll do, we might do some sweat testing, it's going to be pretty hot up there, just because we can. Um, what else we wanted to do, let's try to look at some hydration stuff as well. Um, try to really make sure I take on enough nutrition so I can be quite consistent across the race, I don't want to hit the wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe even look in, looking into some of those new Nike runners or something like that, just to give me some extra, just the, extra the, spring the, in the, the step. The extra one percenter at the top. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll document that as we go, but um, we're sort of trying to... Trying to wing it in a sense, but, yeah. but use use science a bit to to get through a, a three thirty, which you know is, is not uh, certainly maybe not the not the quickest time, but off off zero training is is mm. probably not not a bad well, zero specific but training. There's still yeah, and there's still a lot of still, still a lot of athletes we see who are trying to aim for three thirty. So if you can do it off not much training, maybe there is something in what we can what we can get out of what the testing shows and what uh, what you do in that three weeks. Is there is there something we can apply to other training programs where we have a bit more time? That again, talking about specificity and, and blocking things out. Where do we need to focus our most of our time on? Is there 
I don't, want, I don't want to call it a special secret to, to getting prepped for a marathon in a couple of weeks, but is there something in that um, that is beneficial? Or alternatively, the other way, if you're completely bombed, we know flat out three-week prep yep. isn't, isn't a good idea. Oh. But yeah, so it's going to be an interesting one either way. We're going to have this... It's going to be are we going to release this to everyone to watch the stuff, or will we just yeah. put a mastermind? No, no, uh, we'll put, jump in mastermind jump just in so you mastermind get it. Jump in mastermind so you can definitely keep track of what's going on. I think we'll put updates in there and that, but um, across a, across social, you'll be able to see what's happening with some of the testing and that as well. Uh, yeah, so keep on, an eye over the next couple of weeks. Jump on the Mets Performance uh, Instagram for sure, and say so we will video the whole thing. Mm. Um, I'll do some updates and I want to get my phone out halfway through the marathon, through the marathon. see how I'm going, give you some updates. It'll be good till probably live. 25k, and then yeah. I'll be struggling after that. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see how we go. It's a bit of fun, just something to do, um, and uh, hopefully get some good content out of it. Yeah. So if you're looking forward to having a look at that, jump across all the all the socials and jump in Mastermind to to keep up to date with what's happening with uh, Luke's progress in terms of Gold Coast Marathon. If you got questions like the guys did uh, throughout the week that you want answered on the podcast, we just sort of dedicate this episode to those questions uh, from the Mastermind groups. So the only way to ask them is to be in there. We'll leave some links down the bottom so you can jump in if you're not already involved. But if you already are, feel free to ask your questions. We'll answer them with a, a few little responses. And then if we've got enough sort of interest on it, we'll definitely get a podcast episode up to, to go a bit more in depth about it. Um, it if, if we've got enough people sort of interested in that topic or if it is something that we haven't covered so far. So as many questions you like are welcome in there. Get involved, get, uh, get around it. And otherwise, we'll see you in the next episode.